Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. Sir. Okay. As a general rule, in IVC thrombus, the arterial uh, the arterial control should be as early as possible. The reasons are that ten percent of the cardiac output flows through each kidney, and this percentage increases significantly if there is a large renal tumor. Most of the patients with IVC thrombus are associated with large renal tumors also, and there is a lot of arteriovenous shunting going on within the tumor. Added to that, if the vein is obstructed, there is obviously a lot of collateral circulation, and all these vessels keep on bleeding till the artery is controlled. And as early as possible, the artery must be controlled. So now I'll straight away. Come on to the management of level four thrombus. The standard technique, which has been used, which was initially described by Andrew Novick's team from Cleveland Clinic, is that the patient is put on cardiopulmonary bypass, and after putting the patient on cardiopulmonary bypass, the patient is cooled to a temperature of 18 to 20 degrees centigrade, which is called deep hypothermia. after that the patient is exsanguinated exsanguinated means that from the body the the venous blood continues to flow out the arterial inflow is stopped and once the patient is exsanguinated then there is a deep hypothermic circulatory arrest deep hypothermic circulatory arrest means that the heart lung machine is also stopped then the patient is obviously in a state which you can imagine how close to the heaven the patient is at that particular time and then at that time the uh, the atrium is opened the ivc is opened and the thrombus is taken out we have modified this technique and what we do is we put the patients on cardiopulmonary bypass but we cool these patients to a temperature of only 32 degrees centigrade and we do not exsanguinate the patients we do not stop the heart lung machine and we carry out what we call as partial circulatory arrest by clamping the supraceliac aorta i'll just show you these steps in the video and once you clamp the supraceliac aorta the blood flow to the lower half of the body stops and after that you have to wait for 2 to 3 minutes for the ivc and all that area to become avascular and there is still some bleeding i'll show you how much is the bleeding that is going on so aorta is cross clamped at the supraceliac level just below the diaphragm and the venous return is maintained by cannulae in the supra in the superior vena cava and in the inferior vena cava below the thrombus the arterial perfusion is maintained by the heart lung machine into the aorta and because the supraceliac aorta is clamped only the upper half of the body gets perfused which means that the cerebral the coronary bronchial and upper limb vessels are maintained the cerebral and coronary vascular uh, perfusion is extremely important although there is a loss of arterial inflow to the liver to the bowel and to the kidneys but at a temperature of 32 degrees centigrade these organs can tolerate ischemia up to 30 minutes easily and most of the surgery can actually be done within a period of 16 or 17 minutes so the advantages of partial circulatory arrest are that it is significantly easier and we know that it is efficacious and all the problems associated with deep hypothermia and circulatory arrest are avoided the problems with deep hypothermia are that at that low temperature all the coagulation enzymes stop working and patient can go into a state of diffuse oozing and once diffuse oozing starts then patients go into dic and once dic starts then there is a major consumption coagulopathy then there is a major problem the cns uh, neurological manifestations because of cns ischemia hepatic and renal dysfunction because of uh, uh, the ischemia to these areas is also important the the uh, the uh, septic complications because of bowel ischemia the all these issues have to be kept in mind so now i come to the uh, video 
left radical nephrectomy has already been done and you can see the left renal vein stump the left kidney and adrenal area are all the patient had a huge tumor and yes so the ivc below is soft and the ivc above is full of tumor chest being opened pericardium being opened patient being readied for cardiopulmonary bypass look at this this is the supraciliac aortic dissection the, the two the crura of the diaphragm a the vessel the fibers have to be separated and once the fibers are separated you can identify the aorta and then you can dissect all around the aorta you basically need to dissect three walls of the aorta the posterior wall you need not dissect because right behind is the bony spine and if you you can cross clamp the aorta and confirm that the aortic pulsation below is finished and once you have done that then you have to put the patient on cardiopulmonary bypass so this is now the patient is being put on cardiopulmonary bypass this is the cannula going into the superior vena cava and this is the cannula going into the inferior vena cava and this is the cannula going into the aorta and once the cardiopulmonary bypass is completed then the patient is cooled to a temperature of 32 degrees centigrade and once the cooling is done this is the cardioplegia is given and after the cardioplegia the supraciliac aorta is clamped now we are ready to open the ivc so this is the ivc with the left renal vein stump and the ivc is being opened you can see there is a significant amount of bleeding but this entire bleeding can be sucked into a small sucker which is going into the heart lung machine so once the sucker is put into the ivc the entire blood that is coming out from the ivc from the right renal vein from the lumbar veins and from other hepatic veins etc is now being sucked into the heart lung machine and you can see that you have a relatively bloodless field and with this relatively bloodless field you have 16 to 18 minutes or 20 25 minutes to take the entire thrombus out and once you have pulled the thrombus out whatever tiny uh, pieces of thrombus are sticking onto the wall they can be taken away you can even use a swab you can use your finger to take away all these uh, uh, stuck parts of the tumor thrombus thrombus is and then you can put in a sucker from the ivc up into the atrium so this is a sucker which is you can see the right renal vein which is bleeding a little bit so this is the right atrium being opened after the right atrium has been opened you can see that there is a thrombus that is still residual in the uh, right atrium you can use trans esophageal echocardiography to see real time how much of the thrombus is remaining and this is a thrombus being taken out from the right atrium and once you have taken it out from the right atrium and you have taken out the pieces you can see the sucker from below has come up into the right atrium you can see the sucker coming out from the ivc into the right atrium there is a gauze piece being pushed from the right atrium down into the ivc and the same gauze piece is being pulled out from below so whatever sticking is there the entire thrombus can be taken out now this is closure back and then after that there would be a reversal of uh, the cardiopulmonary bypass and then the patient would be closed this is deairing of the heart deairing of the aorta i'll talk about air embolism later on the cardiopulmonary bypass has been removed and the patient is being closed this is a closure of the sternum this is the specimen uh we have published in the indian journal of uh, surgery and this is the data till december 2018 we have done four more cases after that in this uh, 23 in these 23 patients the bypass time was 53 plus minus 8.9 minutes the aortic cross clamp time was 18 plus minus 2 minutes and we lost two patients in the initial 30 day period and in the follow up of from 10 to 70 minutes the median disease free survival was 42 months this is till 2018 our entire data you see we had renal vein patients four intra intrahepatic 32 in 
intrahepatic 36, suprahepatic 3, atrial 23, and we lost four of these patients, two of the level 3 thrombus and two of the level 4 thrombus in the perioperative period. The median survival of level 1 and level 2, 54 months, and median survival in level 3 and 4, 42 months. Our team, there's, I, there are many more names, and the whole slide will fill up. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for excellent uh, video. In the Skinner series, I have a question to you, sir. Yes. The Skinner series, they have compared the uh, blood loss between clamping the renal artery versus uh, suprarenal uh, aorta. Yes. There was no difference in the blood loss. How do you explain that? Uh, I, I, I don't ex I don't accept that because uh, there is so much of bleeding. You saw that the IVC was full most of the time despite the supraceliac aorta being cross-clamped. Yeah. I know there are other ways also. The one can cross-clamp, uh, do a Pringles cross-clamping also. But this way one gets a relatively bloodless field. The whole idea of deep hypothermic circulatory arrest was to get a bloodless field. Bloodless and uh, the lesser you clamp, the more bloody the field would be and there, the likelihood of leaving something back either in the atrium or in the IVC would be more. And this is not as effective as deep hypothermic circulatory arrest, but efficacious enough to provide you a relatively bloodless field in which you can work comfortably for 16, 18, 20 minutes or even up to 30 minutes, but we have never needed to go beyond 20 minutes. 20 minutes are good enough for opening the atrium from IVC for doing whatever you want to and then suturing it back and then slowly rewarming the patient and bringing the patient back from uh, uh, the uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Can we go back to Dr. Gagan? Gagan? I, I'm so sorry. I think, uh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, so something, you know, my screen suddenly shut down and a message came in Chinese. Uh, so I was very afraid whether, you know, whether this uh, virus is only for humans or this virus is for some other types of <laughs> machines as well. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to try this again now. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, we were on this slide. If uh, there's any problem, you know, just call me and cut me out and carry on sure, because sure, the sure. Chinese virus may come back. You can probably start, uh, go back to one or two slides before so that we can get better continuity. Sure. So I was talking basically about the fact that patients who are, uh, you know, who have a poorer renal function have other medical issues related to that, those issues. And because of that, even for larger tumors, the survival for a partial nephrectomy may actually be better than under those patients who undergo a radical nephrectomy. Uh, and part of it is probably because of the decrease in the chances of having a cardiovascular event in those patients who undergo a nephron uh, sparing surgery as compared to a radical nephrectomy. And that, of course, can contribute to a large extent in decreasing the morbidity and mortality of, uh, the, of these patients. Now, However, we do know that when we go ahead and decide to do a partial nephrectomy or radical nephrectomy, no two, two tumors are completely alike. So not all T1Bs and T2s are created equal. In fact, uh, they, you, for example, you can have a smaller tumor right in the middle of the hilum, like in this picture, and you know very clearly that these, this patient cannot be taken up for a, radical nephrect for a partial nephrectomy and requires a radical nephrectomy. On the other hand, if you see this particular T2 tumor, which is about eight centimeters in size, this patient underwent a robotic partial nephrectomy about uh, five years back and is doing very well as of now. So this is something which we have to take into account. And for the benefit of the postgraduates, they must already be knowing that there are a number of nephrometry scores available. Uh, there is the Padua score, there is a C index, there is the renal nephrometry score. And out of this, probably the renal nephrometry score is the most popular where you take into account not only the size of the tumor, but also its location, how much endophytic or exophytic it is, and how it is located with relative to the, relative to the polar lines and whether it's anterior or posterior. This nephrometry score can be done very easily. 
all you need to do is download a simple app from the app store and you can at the bedside calculate the nephrometry score within a few seconds. And of course, there are various studies looking at the benefits of these nephrometry scores. And if you just look at this renal nephrometry score, it has been found that this correlates significantly with the chances of complications. So with every one increase, one point increase in renal nephrometry score, there's about a 30% increase in the chances of complications. And if you look at the, the posteriorly paced tumors, particularly with the suffix P, the chances of having a complication increases by 2.6 times as compared to the anterior tumors in, in this subgroup. So what about the outcomes of partial nephrectomy in this situation? Now, if you look at the outcomes of partial nephrectomy, uh, there has the probably one of the best ways to do this is to look at the meta-analysis that has been published in, in European urology, where they looked at tumors which were T1B or T2 and above. And it was found that patients who underwent a T2, a partial nephrectomy for a T2 tumor, they had lesser post had a, had greater post-operative complications as compared to patients undergoing radical nephrectomy. And that's obvious because the complexity of the tumor or the complexity of the procedure is much more in this particular situation. But if you looked at the renal functional outcomes, like the post-operative EGFR, you looked at the chances of onset of new chronic kidney disease, or you looked at all-cause mortality, or in all of these parameters, partial nephrectomy was favored not only for the smaller tumors, but also for the T1Bs and also for the T2s. However, like... Uh, has been said, all this should be taken with a pinch of salt. There is a statutory warning attached to all this data because it basically consists of a multiple multitude of low level studies, which are retrospective analysis from databases. There is obviously a propensity for a selection bias in this situation, and the data may not be truly representative. For example, a gentleman who's younger, fitter, and who doesn't have any comorbidities may have been more likely taken up for a, a partial nephrectomy as compared to a radical nephrectomy, and that may skew the data because of the selection bias. There is also some evidence to show that, the, that partial nephrectomy actually may not be beneficial for all groups of patients. For example, in this propensity score matched analysis of the National Cancer Database, it was shown that in T1B tumors, while the overall survival was better for patients undergoing partial nephrectomy, this benefit was lost in patients above 75 years of age and was kind of doubtful between 65 and 75 years of age. So those people with a limited life expectancy and comorbidity may actually may not benefit that much from a partial nephrectomy, may not live long enough to benefit from a partial nephrectomy. So especially in those patients who have larger tumors, who, who are in the elderly age group, but have a reasonably good function of the kidney on the opposite side, probably these patients may be thought about twice before offering a partial nephrectomy. Uh, the various different approaches of a partial nephrectomy, even for larger tumors, are more or less similar to that, that of a smaller tumors. These patients have similar trifecta outcomes, and these patients ultimately uh, will do well with any form of partial nephrectomy. However, those patients who undergo a robotic partial nephrectomy have a decreased warm ischemia time as compared to a laparoscopic partial nephrectomy overall, and the complication rates seem to be lower with robotic rather than the open approach. However, again, this may not apply in all situations with all people, and probably it is more important to stress the importance of the procedure itself rather than the approach. So a partial nephrectomy needs to be done where it's indicated and one shouldn't really worry about whether you're doing open lap or, red or, or uh, robotic, provided you're not doing a radical nephrectomy in these situations. And finally, I'd just like to wrap up this presentation with a brief overview of our own data. We have done 92 partial nephrectomies in the about three and a half year period. And out of those, 44 have been for patients who are T1B or above. And when we looked at the, our robotic data comparing the T1As and the T1Bs, and we did this analysis in this paper was presented in UCCon recently, we found that there wasn't really much difference between the two factors, except that the console time was obviously longer in the T1Bs, and even the decline in renal function was more in the T1Bs, 
probably more related to the fact that you're removing a larger proportion of the kidney. Otherwise, the hospital stay, complication rates, you know, chances of recurrence, even warm ischemia time, though there is a numerical difference, even these factors were not found to be significantly different, thereby showing that at least in selected cases in T1Bs and in T2s, you can safely do a, a robotic partial nephrectomy. Thank you very much for your time and attention and apologies again for the for the hang up in the in the in the presentation thank you, thank you. Uh, i would like to ask you one question what is your experience of using uh, tks and uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors in a pre surgical setting to make this large tumor amenable for partial nephrectomy so we have never used them is a simple answer and the reason for that is that in in according to most studies Firstly, the TKIs will not have effect on every single patient. So it, even if you look at the optimistic response rate of about 40%, it means that 60% of the tumors may, complete, may continue to grow. And in over a period of time, it may actually become more difficult to do a partial nephrectomy because of that. And secondly, there have been studies which have shown that the mean response in terms of decrease in the size of the tumor is only about 10%. So if you have, say, uh, you know, an eight centimeter tumor, and it becomes a 7.5 centimeter tumor, five millimeters less. I don't think you have achieved much in terms of the ease of doing the surgery, and as well as the, you know, decrease in complications, or as well as increasing the parenchymal preservation. So I do believe that you may end up losing more time by using this TKIs, and uh, probably it will be better to just go ahead and do the best operation that you can rather than putting these patients in new adjuvant. Certainly no guidelines recommend this as a standard of care. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Vivian. There are no guidelines, but uh, there are small series where they have used the pembrolizumab plus axitinib, uh, more than 40 to 50% uh, reduction in the size of the tumor is there, where it is relatively easy for us to do partial nephrectomy. Thank you for that.